Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today's guest is a judo champion. She had her sight set on Tokyo 2020. However, concussion meant that that wasn't going to happen. But as one door closed, another opened. And she welcomed her baby daughter in August 21. Since then, her sights are now firmly set on the Paris Olympics 2024. Nicoda Smythe Davis. Hi. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. I mean, it's been, I, I know that your life, like you, you speak so well about the fact that your life is in these like four year cycles. Mm. And to have one cycle kind of not happen mm. how you thought it would. Yeah. Like it must feel like, I th- do you set out at the start of a, a like of, as an athlete, do you start thinking ahead and kind of going, this is what life's going to be like. Yeah, you plan everything really closely. Um, down to the point I knew when I would try and have my first baby. Yeah. Um, you know, where I'm going to live, everything. You plan everything out. Um, you even plan when your holidays are going to be because, you know, like my family live in Jamaica and I'm kind of like, well, there needs to be a big holiday. So really that needs to be after the game. So then, you know, right. I'm going to wait four years and I'm going to go then. So everything is planned out. And I had everything planned out for after Tokyo. That was when I was going to retire. That was when I wanted to start my family. And yeah, nothing went to plan. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess let's go back to that, to, to your concussion, I guess. Like how far out of Tokyo did you know that that wasn't going to be happening? Um, so the concussion was end of 2019 and original Tokyo Games was yeah. uh, summer 2020. So... I did actually. But that's get, like three and a half years. Of yeah, being focused towards that. Of course, God. and I'd just gone straight from the Rio cycle as well. Yeah. So really, it was seven and you know seven and a half years yeah. of work towards a games that I knew I could peak at. Yeah, I was going to be twenty seven in my prime, and in that cycle, in those three years, I'd won two world medals. Yeah, so kind of already up there with with all the best in the world. Um, and I kind of got to the point where. I'd got back at the start of 2020. Uh, it was a slow return to play. It probably took me about two, three months. Mm. And that's a little bit slow for a regular concussion. Regular right. co- concussions, two weeks and you're kind of back. So we took it slow. And as I was just getting back into things, the, the pandemic happened. And that just derailed all my progress. Because um, obviously your recovery and everything relies on you being with people and you being able to yeah. do that recovery, I, I imagine. Yeah, and also the contact element of it. Yeah. You know, a lot of, um, you know, the brain, I had to work a lot on like the neck strengthening stuff and doing judo, it's very dynamic. You get thrown through the air, you do loads of rolls and tumbles and it's about that kind of like where you are in space yeah. and to be stuck at home for five months, five and a half months, not doing any of that, training by myself, just doing circuit training. Mm. Um, I just lost all tolerance to be able to to do that, to be able to be thrown and to throw people and to do flips and things like that. So when I tried to go back to the sport um, later on in 2020, when it was postponed to 2021, um, I just got a little knock to the head, a really tiny one, yeah. um, as we were practicing some drills. And I was unwell for about three months after that, really unwell. Like I, I could barely go for walks with the dog. I just had to be in like darkness, in quiet. Um, I was suffering with migraines every day and it, life was miserable. Yeah. Life was really miserable. And I just thought if this is what could potentially happen again if I tried to push on to the games. I'm not sure it's worth it. I'm not sure I could do it mentally. It was so tough. Oh, it sounds horrible. Yeah. Yeah, and anyone who's ever had kind of concussion symptoms will know how real all of that feels yeah. and how alone you feel because nobody can see it. It's every you, you can feel it and nobody can see it. It's not like an ACL injury or a physical injury that someone can see. Oh, there's swell in there. There's bruise in there. You know, we can see that you're injured. It's like, are you sure that you feel the way you say you, you feel? And it's like, this is my right Does reality make every you day. you question things as well, having other people kind of go... Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, there's so many days I was like, is this in my head? Am I struggling with pressure here? Am I struggling with the idea of going into the games as a favourite and that pressure of, you know, you really should be getting a medal kind yeah. of thing. 
And I did I did question that. And it wasn't until I found a community within the concussion community, um, Facebook pages, Instagram pages, forums, where other people were literally just experiencing the same thing as me. And it wasn't until I chatted to also other athletes that had gone through the same thing that I was like, actually, all of this is real. All these mm. symptoms are real. Everything I feel is real. Um, and it's serious. It's really serious. This is a brain injury. And I've got to choose between a sport and the rest of my life right now. Mm. Yeah. I imagine it's not until you're in something like that that you actually know more about it. No, I didn't know anything. I was so naive. I was so na I didn't even know I had concussion when I first had concussion. Really? Yeah. And I think that's what made it worse was I carried on training through it. And it wasn't until I got a second knock 10 days later that that was kind of like the, the finishing tip blow, basically. That um, that gave me a secondary concussion. And that's a lot worse than just a, a, a single concussion. And that's why I think I, it took me so long to, to recover and get back. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how does one become a judo champion? Like, what was your childhood like? Were you someone who, like, did you have siblings? Were you really physical? Yeah. Like, what were you like as a child? Yeah, as a child, like, I was not a fighter. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'm just going to say it. Because if my seven-year-old became a judo, I'd be like, yeah, okay, I see it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was not a fighter. I was shy. I was, yeah, it was very hard to get me out of my shell as a kid. And I think that's what judo did, though. I right. think where what you see now is just like, oh, it's just fighting. But actually there's a lot of other elements to judo. Yeah. And the martial arts itself, there's a lot of learning. Yeah. And you learn the different names of holds and throws and you do like a grading where you get tested on it and stuff. And I love that because I was very academic at school. So yeah. I, I love that side of it. And then every time it would be like, end of the session, okay, we're going to do some fighting practice. I'd be like, oh gosh, I've got to fight people. Again. Did you just do it because it was something that was going on yeah. in the community and you were like... Oh, yeah, I always join. felt out of my comfort zone doing fighting <laughs> and competitions, but it was kind of like I could just be encouraged to try. But why did you start it? Um, so I started because my mum is... She's sports mad and she's right. music mad. Okay. And she put us in the sport. She said, I want you guys to do something sporty and um, judo also is self-defense as well. Yeah. So she was very much like, we're growing up in London. We are, she's a single parent. Right. She, she raised us on her own. How many of you? Um, me and my brother, me right. and my younger brother. There's only a year and eight months between us. So we were really close. And she just said, I want you guys to be able to look after yourselves. Yeah. You know, she, we're first generation as well in Britain. She's from Jamaica originally and um, actually migrated here pregnant with me. So, um, it was tough. Life was tough growing mm -hmm. up. And I think she was just very much like, I want you guys to do something outside of school, but I also want you to learn self-defense. And that's why she kind of pushed us into judo. Um, she knew nothing about the sport as well. So I'm like, well done, mum. Isn't mom. that crazy? Yeah. Like, knowing nothing about it and choosing, and you not liking it, really, like yeah. having moments of feeling a bit not sh unsure of, of yeah. it. And it's become your I know your thing. It's It's incredible. It's incredible. Like you, you couldn't have you couldn't have written it basically. Yeah. Um, and I tried to quit as well. I tried <laughs> to quit when I was eleven because uh, I went to my primary school club. Yeah. And obviously, you get too big for primary school, and you've got to move. And I just thought, well, I'm not moving to a new club. I'm gonna I'm gonna just quit because I'm too scared. And my mum was like, well, why don't you just try and get your black belt? That's a nice goal. Then you know, it was never Olympics or anything like that. Yeah. It was just. But also, I, I yeah. wonder if when you're a kid. For some people, like the Olympics was, um, I mean, I'm not a sporty person, but the Olympics wasn't something that was chucked about as if like, no if you idea. do this, you could go and do that. No, I didn't even make the connection that my sport was even an Olympic sport. I mean, my mum's sports mad, so we watched Olympics on the TV right. growing up, but I didn't make that connection. It yeah. probably, I didn't make that connection probably till I was about 18. Really? Yeah, that the Olympics was even something that I could consider. And then I guess that dream didn't really spark until the London Olympics because I volunteered there and I was 19 at the time. And it was only then that I was like, I think I want to try. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have that dream from a, a young kid. Yeah. A lot of a lot of sports people do. They say, you know, I had that dream when I was younger. You know, that's the person I wanted to be. I didn't have that. Yeah. I think m mostly because I just didn't think I could have that. I think growing up like, poor and not having a lot I wanted to do loads as a kid 
but kind of the judo was one of the cheapest sports as well at the time. So my mum put us in judo and it was kind of like, we struggled even there, you know, people would give us their hand-me-down kits and sometimes our teachers would waive fees or pay for competitions for us, you know. they I guess they really saw something in us and wanted to help. Yeah. And without all that, I genuinely wouldn't be here today doing what I'm doing. So, yeah, I'm so grateful that I had those amazing people around me and that my mum was kind of like, go, go for your black belt. Just keep pushing on. Don't just give up. And what happened when you got your black belt? Um, so I was 15 when I got my black belt. And at that point, it, it got pretty competitive. When I moved to that new club when I was 11, they were just kind of like, we're just going to put you in a little competition this weekend. I was, I'd been there two, like two weeks. I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do that. It was the national championships. <laughs> <laughs> I took a bronze medal. I didn't even know that I had done that. And uh, they just was like, she's good. She's good and we're going to nurture it. And yeah, again, if it weren't for those coaches, I genuinely wouldn't be here today. Oh, my God. Yeah. And you say that you're academic. Yeah. So were you, uh, did your academic studies, like, did you have something in mind that you wanted to do from that rather than judo or not? Yeah. So I was like, I, I always wanted to be a doctor growing up. And I wanted to work with kids and I wanted to help people and that's kind of when I went to college, those are, you know, I picked sciencey subjects and maths and I went down that route because, again, I didn't have that Olympic dream. That yeah. wasn't in my mind. Yeah. I was just going to kind of use my brain because that's what I was good at. Um, and it, things probably started ramping up during college, those two years of college. And I guess that last year of college, I spent a lot of time out, out traveling mm -hmm. with the junior team. Um, and again, my school was amazing. They'd give me like packs of work to go away with for a week or two um, so I could work while I was away training on camps and But stuff. that's also you being amazing because yeah. I imagine for a lot of kids that would be like, that is staying in the wrapper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I guess so. I guess I was very much like I wanted to achieve in both if yeah. I could. Um, but it was tough. I'm not going to lie, it was tough. Um, and, I, and I guess towards the end of college, I was very much like I need a break from education if I'm going to do judo seriously. I, yeah. I knew at that point I couldn't do both. Um, and then things just really picked up for me quite quickly after that. Um, I did the Commonwealth Games at 21 and I won mm -hmm. that. And then I qualified for the Olympics age 23. So, yeah, it just I, I'm glad I made that sacrifice, although I never I have. I still haven't gone back to education um, and we're 10 years into this elite career now. Um but it was a sacrifice, I think, that was really worth it. I mean, how does it feel to say I'm an elite and I'm, I'm an elite athlete? That oh. must be such a that's such a massive thing to say. That's yeah. huge. Yeah, it just I guess it shows dedication, doesn't it? Yeah. That you've committed your life to something big. And although it's a short lived career really in the grand scheme of your life, it's something that you're always gonna be able to look back on and just be really proud. Yeah. That you that you did it. Yeah. And now that you're a mum, does it make you look back at your own mum and what she would have done oh, like, throughout those early years and in early career and stuff? Massively. That's one of the big things that I think I, when I became a mum, I was kind of like, oh my gosh, mums are incredible. Mums are amazing. And I'm so grateful for her and everything that she's... I think you're hard on your parents when you're growing up, aren't you? Of course you, you are. Because, I, I, I mean, I have this now with my kids, mine are nine, seven and five. You are their comfort place. You know, mm. you are the space that whatever happens, mm. they have you. Yeah. They can treat you however they like. They ha And mm. it's because they feel safe. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I tell you, I think I was hard work sometimes. And I look back now and, I mean, I'm one of six. So we've got... Wow! Yeah, <laughs> one of six. So I grew up... It was me and my little brother and then yeah. my other siblings live live in Jamaica. Um, but yeah, my mum was just kind of like, and I had six of you, so <laughs> you can imagine. I'm just like, yeah, you're all absolutely incredible. I just have this newfound appreciation for, for parents. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever look ahead to yourself becoming a mum? I dreamed about it almost every day, every day. And I think it really started like ramping up for me, probably after the Rio Olympics right. in 2016, I'd kind of got into this the end of this really big goal that you work towards and it's one day and then it's over yeah and I didn't win I lost I lost in the second round to a really good French player and it broke me it was so tough picking yourself up mm. after that and just getting back to it and I knew I wanted to go again to yeah. another but then I was kind of like I really want I really want to start a family um and so that was tough telling myself that I needed to wait another four years 
um, to do that. But I would dream about it every day. Really? Every day. Yeah. Yeah. And when did you meet your partner? So I met my partner, we've been together about four years now. Right. Um, so that was towards the back end of the Tokyo cycle. Right. Um, so, yeah, it was kind of like... So I do this crazy sport where I basically travel a lot and <laughs> I'm trying to go to the Olympics next year. Are you, are you okay with that? Because he's not a judo guy. Right. Um, and that's kind of like first time for me is like dating a, is, someone outside of the sport. Does he, is he sporty? Does he do he loves, sport? He loves football. Right, loves okay. Sport, um, but not... That's not his It's not path. his job, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was kind of refreshing and he completely understood it. He was completely like, no, I'm here, I support you and... And you know things. <laughs> but you're a bit like, so I need to have a baby now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, literally, <laughs> literally. He was so good because we'd met, and then I got my concussion not long after that. Right. And then obviously, I think I did two competitions while I was with him, and then that was that. So I guess he didn't get that full experience. But then the pandemic happened, and yeah. you know it kind of sped things up. And we just had that conversation when I made the decision to not push on to the Olympics. And I just said, you know, we'd already talked about it because he definitely wanted kids as well. He's a, he's a year older than me. So he was like, I do want kids soon. And I know you do too. And, you know, we'll speak about it when the right time is. And we just had that chat. And a month later, we were pregnant. Ah. <laughs> it just happened so fast. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, really fast, really blessed. And mentally, I mean, how, what? where were you? Because obviously, when the concussion got really, really bad and you yeah. had that, that further knock and you knew that you weren't going to from so was it a relief to kind of go actually I'm not doing th those Olympics and actually we're moving on to this new chapter like or was there still like is there a grieving period that mm. comes with that yeah I, I it was such a tough time I, I felt like I was in a hole and right. like I couldn't I couldn't come up for air I couldn't get out of it. it I was just there every day and when I made the decision to not push on to the games that was November 2020 so the games would have been the following year and it was after a conversation with the neurologist who just said look I can't promise you that this won't happen again and I had just come out of that really horrible three months of yeah. migraines and stuff and I just thought I don't I can't mentally do it I can't mentally go for that goal again and it not happen mm. that would absolutely break me and I made that decision and the the, the weight was just lifted off my shoulders. Really? I could breathe again. And I, the way I sort of made peace with it, because there was a grieving period, but people were disappointed and they were going to be. They had put, That's the thing you're having to manage other people's yeah. Yeah, emotions and stuff. They had put obviously everything into me going to the games, whether it was British Judo or Team GB or yeah. my coaches, family. But I just thought, you know what? Nobody is as disappointed as me. Yeah. And then that's how I made peace with dealing with everyone else's emotions. Mm -hmm. I said, nobody wants it more than I do. Nobody is as disappointed as me. And I just was like, I need to live my life. Yeah. Um, and then we just had that conversation. And by December, we were pregnant. So what was it like when you found out? Did you um, have any symptoms that made you go, oh, I should probably test? Yes, I did. I, I had my normal PMS symptoms, yeah. um, probably just a bit more intensified. And I I was tracking my period on the Flow app. So um, I kind of known that we were probably got pregnant around the right time of the cycle and everything. So when it was like the day of my period or miss period, I took a test and I took the test. It looked like it was negative. I put the test on the floor. Um, I actually did have a bit of a bleed as well. Right. Um, so I was kind of like, oh, I've just I've come on. Yeah. So I was like... It's all right. It's the first, first month. month. Yeah, it's fine. Um, then went to put the pick the stick up and put it in the bin, and then saw a second line, <laughs> and then I thought, no, I'm not pregnant. No, <laughs> it took probably three days for it to sink in. I had to take another test three days later, and I was like, nope, I'm still pregnant, <laughs> and we're definitely well, doing especially this. Especially then, if you've got a line and a bleed, I think it's only. Yeah. When you start looking into, you know, what those early bleeds yeah. are, but you don't know that until no. you start trying. No, and I was so confused. I did so I didn't didn't believe I was pregnant until I took another test, um, and obviously I only had one day, a one day bleed, so I didn't have the full period. And I yeah. thought, okay, that's strange. Um, and then it was probably about six seven weeks I started getting like a morning sickness and yeah. feeling really rough. So I was like, yeah, we're definitely on this journey now. But it was just amazing. We were so excited. And 
even in the hard bits of pregnancy, I loved it all because yeah. I just think I'd been looking forward to it for so long um, that I was just, yeah, embracing this new life of mine. And what was it like sharing that news? Um, it, it was amazing. It was everyone's reaction. And I kind of took my time telling everyone. Mm -hmm. I, it was something that was very, I wanted to keep it to us. Yeah. And it was special. So I told just immediate family straight away. My mum, how do mums do this? I, I picked up the phone. I said, mum, I've got something to tell you. She's got a really strong Jamaican accent as well. She was like, you're pregnant. <laughs> I was like, how do you know? Like, how do you know that? And she was just so happy for me. Like, Aww. it didn't, not once did she say, what about the Olympics next year? You know what I mean? She was just super happy for me. And she's just like, whatever you choose to do afterwards, I'm here to support you. And she is. She's amazing now. You know, she steps in and looks after the little one when I go away now on trips. Yeah. So, yeah. That's incredible. Mm. It must be so hard. I think there are so many professions where it feels like having a baby might be the end of that mm. that career path. And I think there's so much uncertainty that can lie around so many different mm. professions, whether that's being on stage or, you know, yeah. as an athlete and stuff. Did you, Was that something that you'd spoken to other people about before getting pregnant? Was that something you were worried about? I was... I'd spoken to friends and everyone knew how kind of maternal I was and how much I really wanted kids. Mm. Um, but it wasn't something that I discussed with like my my um, my team yeah. kind of where I train. Um, we've got I train at the National Centre in Warsaw and we've got a whole team around us and I hadn't had discussed it with anyone. Did anyone discuss like families and motherhood and stuff? Um, we had a couple guys that had kids, but it just wasn't the same. Yeah. Um, it had just never been done before. Nobody in my sport had had a baby and even considered coming back. So I just didn't even know how to start the conversation yeah. with anyone. Um, and I think when I made that decision, I had made that decision accepting that I potentially wouldn't go back to the sport. Yeah. Um, because I just didn't think that there was an avenue for that. I just didn't think it was possible. So it wasn't until... I got my had my 12 week scan and I felt more comfortable telling more people there um that we were kind of like right what happens now <laughs> and we sort of went on that journey together as a sport me and yeah. the sport um but yeah I, if you've never seen something done before you don't know it's possible no you don't yeah but so, you're nervous telling them really nervous really and I was surprised by their reactions yeah they were so happy for me um so, yeah, I was really shocked. I was sort of bracing for this really disappointed sounding, you know, responses. And I didn't get that. All I got was support. So it was really refreshing. Must have been a real big relief. Yeah, 100%. And I was kind of like, OK, they do have my back and we can go on this journey together. And again, I had no expectations of coming back to the sport. But I was kind of like, but if I do want to, I know they will support me. And that was good. Well, so you spent so much time together. Mm. It must feel like a fan, like that, that they're your family in a, in a way. Yeah, yeah. And I think that when you're in it, it's it's tough because emotions are high yeah. constantly. And well, and you must get loads of adrenaline and stuff. Yeah. when you are on the mat. Yeah, a hundred percent. But because we're always preparing for events as well, and we're a weight controlled sport, so you know, you're having to watch what you eat and it's just a very tense environment. You can imagine living with someone who's like tetchy all the time and on yeah. edge, it's like that. So you're <laughs> like... For 15 minutes until my next piece of chicken, yeah, don't talk to me. <laughs> literally. So you kind of feel like you're at each other's throats all really? the time, even though you're so supportive of each other, but you have that kind of like, you're stuck together relationship. Yeah. So... Was that a relief in some way then to just... Like, how did you approach motherhood, knowing that, you know, for a lot of the time you are weighed for your sport, you have to, you know, sit within a certain bracket. Mm. Becoming a mum, your body does what it does, mm. you know, and what was that like? Did you feel like you were just embracing the process? and Because mm. you also did, you, you trained during pregnancy yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, so my pregnancy also coincided with my concussion recovery. Yeah. So I guess having that rehab every day to focus on was a good thing for me. And uh, it was a time where I also re like realized I actually can't live without training. Yeah. Like training is like breathing to me. So for me, it just gave me something to do every day. Yeah. Um, 
while I couldn't be on the mat and actually doing full contact, I could be in the gym and I could yeah. be doing, you know, circuits and I could be doing other stuff. So it was, I just tried to embrace it as much as possible because I'd kind of let go of that goal. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's all I've ever had in judo, a goal, something to work towards, something to aim for. And because I didn't have that anymore, I could just find a new version of myself that I'd never seen before yeah and that was amazing because i just tried to embrace every moment i'd read up about how big the baby was each week and i'd take weekly weekly pictures and people were probably sick of me being like gosh nakoda's constantly sending me bump (laughs) bump pics and stuff but i just loved it i absolutely loved it and i loved training and i did some research and read up about you know was it safe to train and stuff like that. well your body was used to it as well yeah yeah um and I just went to my, I never went past my limit. Yeah. I just went to where I was comfortable. Um, but I think it helped me mentally more than anything else. Well, that's the thing. Because you'd just come out of this really dark period. So yeah. to suddenly stop doing the thing that you know and love, mm. that wouldn't have helped you. No. It because was... I think exercise as well, we always talk about it's, it's as much for the mental health mm. as it is for anything else. Yeah. It was like therapy for me. Yeah. It was. It was like therapy. So I, I needed that. And I needed that connection to everyone as well still. Did your like? Did the rest of the team have an intrigue in what was going on with you? Because uh, never having anyone in the sport, yeah, you know, get pregnant. Yeah, was there an intrigue there as to what you're up to? Yeah, a hundred percent. They went and did their research. They went to um, UK Sport at the time and just said, "Look, we've got this athlete. She's pregnant, and we want to support her, and we want to make sure that she's doing the right things and she's safe while she's training and while she's with us." And yeah, they just went and got loads of information and just kept feeding stuff back to me and did the whole process with me, I would say. They almost trained me through my pregnancy, which was nice because it wasn't like I was just doing it on my own. It was like I was still their athlete, but I was just a pregnant athlete. Um, So it was it was really, really surprising, but really nice. Yeah. Um, And then at 35 weeks, they kicked me out of the gym. (laughs) (laughs) They're like, you're not giving birth in the gym, so you need to go home. (laughs) And how did that feel? Did that feel like, right, I'm ready now, almost going on a like mini mat leave or whatever? Was it kind of like, I'm done, I'm ready to... Yeah, I just got full nesting mode and just was home for a few weeks. And I mean, at that point, she was really heavy, so... It was sort of good. I could just put my feet up a bit, and uh, I could. Did you allow yourself to do that? Yeah, I couldn't do much in the gym at that point anyway. She was, um, I'm quite small framed, and she was, she was big, she was big, and I was carrying a lot of water as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was nice to to put my feet up, nest a bit, get ready for her arrival, and just wait. Really, it felt like the longest four weeks of my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Them last four weeks. Well, how did you feel though, heading towards like the birth? Because you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I, and this might be a bit weird, but I try to treat it as Olympic day. So I. Well, people do say, yeah. like, I don't know, they'd hit the birthing and stuff and they said treat it like it's a marathon. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, because I'd done the Olympics before and I knew what that felt like. Yeah. I was kind of like, this is my Olympic day. And I said, the difference is I'm going to leave with my prize this time. <laughs> I didn't get a medal last time, but I will this time. And it's going to be one of the hardest days of my life, but it's going to be so rewarding. Mm -hmm. And I just try to prepare for it in that way. So I did hypnobirthing and I try to educate myself as much as possible. Yeah. Um, Because I'm very much of just be as prepared as you can be. And it might not go to plan, but at least you'll not have the fear of not knowing what might happen. Yeah. Um, So I wanted to eliminate that fear and just going kind of, with the idea of this could go anyway, but I'm ready for it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I was excited, really excited. A little bit nervous, but excited. Yeah. Yeah. And when the day arrived, how did you know? What was the first signs? Um, My waters broke at 5 a.m. I'd had like practice contractions, Braxton Braxton Hicks contractions all week. And my dog was on pins all week. (laughs) It was almost annoying. Really? Yeah. She just literally... She's got these big floppy ears and she'd just like make her eyebrows look really sad. And she'd just stare at me all week. <sighs> and I'm having all these practice contractions. She must have just been so in tune with what was going on. Like the dogs have this intuition. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. I never believed it before until until then. She knew that, that Raya was coming um, and she was so concerned. And I was in and out of hospital that week being monitored yeah. just because I was on like quite a, on the bigger side. Um, my belly was on the bigger side. So... They were just making sure I was okay. Um, And then my waters broke 
on bank holiday weekend on um which I know the hospitals weren't that happy about that. They were like, will you, <laughs> will you come in and be induced um, on the Friday? And I was like, no, nope. my baby will come when my baby's ready. Yeah. And yeah, my water's broke on the... Were you 39 weeks at this point? I was thir- I was 40 and one. Ah, okay. So I was literally one day after right. my due date. Yeah. And I'd had the induction booked in for the following week right. on the Tuesday. But Raya was right on time. She was like, nope, I know when I'm coming. And yeah, water's broke at five. Did that wake you up? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was weird because that night I didn't have any contractions. Yeah. That was the most relaxed my belly had been um, in that last week. And I was kind of like, oh, gosh, it's not going to happen then. Nothing. She's not moving. Nothing's happening. Yeah. And then, yeah, water's broke. And I was like, oh, let's go. And I was so excited. I was literally jumping around like, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to meet happening. my baby. I was so excited. Um, And then I didn't have any contractions for probably a couple hours. Right. But we went to the hospital anyway because they'd sort of moved me up a bit more high risk. And we just waited. And then, yeah, those started more just like period pains. Yeah. And then it started getting serious. That's a funny thing when it starts. (laughs) Yeah. oh, I'm okay. (laughs) And then it's like, oh. I was like, why did nobody tell me? (laughs) This is hard. <laughs> and uh, just did everything we practised and, yeah. And Were then... you surprised at how, like, how did the hypnobirthing affect that process? I think for that, for those initial stages of labour, mm. um, kind of up until you're in active labour, amazing. I think, yeah, helped me get through that without pretty much anything. Yeah. So I just was doing my surge dances and listening to my tracks and, yeah, that really got me through. But then once it kind of hit active labour, I was just kind of like, get this baby out. Really? Now? <laughs> I don't care about hypnobirthing. I don't care about anything. I'm done, okay? <laughs> but it's so good that you were yeah. able to listen to yourself in those moments. You yeah. know what I mean? Because I think sometimes people get so caught up in like, no, this is the plan and I yeah. want to stick to the plan. And actually, the plan for me, I always think should be, this is the plan for now. Yeah. And we'll see how we go. Yeah. I just kept being like to me, but have you come back with my drugs yet? Because I need them now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, um, yeah, I got moved up to delivery. And I think we were in there a couple hours. And it was it was uh, complicated because, yeah, I can't really remember. But I think she was just having trouble coming down right. and coming out. So I needed a bit of assistance and a bit of help. Um, and I was begging for an epidural at this point. I was like, just give it to me. And my partner was like, I was just reading the, the thing to you really slowly because I didn't, I didn't want you to have it. And I know you didn't want to have it. And then, yeah, he just said, you know, you're about nine, ten centimetres. It's a bit too late now. I think we're going to get ready for baby to come. And then you just get that urge to push then, don't you? Yeah. And I was like, they weren't ready. And I was like, I'm pushing because she's coming. And yeah, and yeah, a bit of assistance. And, and she was here. That's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. So no time for the epidural anyway. No, no time for that. Just had to just go for it. <laughs> but it's amazing because, you know, I did sort of everything I'd read, I knew at that point when it was time because yeah. your body just tells you when it's time to push, when it's time to go and baby's coming. And, um, you know, I'm grateful that I kind of had all the hands on deck because cord was around her neck and that's what was restricting her a bit and um, I needed a bit of assistance. So it, it was really good, but I'm just happy, you know, she came safely. And I really wanted to have a natural birth. I wasn't against having a different type of birth, yeah. but I think selfishly for my own recovery for judo and going back to the sport, mm-hmm. I, I wanted to have one natural so I could get back quicker, yeah, yeah, I yeah. guess. Um, but obviously in that moment, I would have gone with, any, with anything. Yeah, I'd have been like, do what you need to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll sort it out later. Yeah, but I was I was happy. I was proud of myself. At the end. I, I wonder if, because in, in like being an athlete, you're so aware of your body and what it can do. And, and you would like, you you know, you might lift a certain weight or whatever mm. that is in your, um, uh, in your training and stuff. What is it like to see your body that you know so well through your training mm. do something completely different? It's so... It's so alien. That's the way I would describe it. It's so alien. And people are like, oh, surely it should have been a bit easier for you. Or, And I think maybe mentally, when you train, you do go to another place. Yeah. And we always laugh at ourselves and say that people that train the way we do might be a little bit crazy because it hurts. Right. But you sort of like it. <laughs> like, I'm in pain, but I love it. Um, so I guess I could tap into that a little bit more. Mm. I remind myself to just get through each contraction. 
But actually being so strong in your core is not necessarily the best thing for, for pushing out a baby. Yeah. So I try to do a lot of work on relaxing my pelvic floor and, um, you know, really trying not to go against my body during birth. But I think in the moment, I think I just tensed. That's what you do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's the fear element. Yeah, it, it is. It is. So I think there's pros and cons. Yeah. Um, but it was completely alien to watch my body go through all of it. Yeah. And then postpartum as well, completely alien. Just everything about it was alien. Well, what firstly, what was it like meeting Raya for the first time? Oh, my gosh. I just, I remember thinking, oh, my God, she's so pale. So, my, <laughs> yeah. So, she's, she's mixed race. You know, I'm Jamaican heritage and my partner's white British. So, she came out and I... I just expected a mini me to pop out. Yeah. I don't know what I was expecting, but I just I was like, oh my God, she's so pale. And I kept going, are you sure she's mine? Are you sure she's mine? <laughs> but yeah, I saw her come out. She's definitely yours. Um, and I was like, oh God, she's beautiful. She's mm. absolutely, she was plump. She came out looking about two months old. Really? Yeah. Well, you said she was big. Like she, I know you had a big belly, but did she come out big as well? She was eight pound nine. Um, so not like overly no. big, not overly big, but she just just looked she's quite a petite little compact thing yeah but she just had rolls she literally <laughs> had like chub chub rolls when she was born um so she was just gorgeous yeah. absolutely gorgeous and i just couldn't believe she was finally here you know you wait nine months to meet them and then it's like oh my god they're here and they're beautiful yeah yeah so gorgeous yeah and how long did you stay in hospital for so we were coming out the back end of Lockdown three. Of course, yeah. Um, when I had her. So um, my partner Joel could only stay up until 10 o'clock, I think it was. I had her at 5 p.m. So it was like a full 12 hours yeah. from start to finish. And then he left at 10. And then I was on my own and I was petrified. And I would say I don't think I bonded with her when she was initially born. And this is the thing. Like, we, we speak about this a lot on the podcast because I think because of the films, because of, there's so much dialogue out there, mm. you know, my world was complete. There was an instant bond. You know, there's so much pressure on that moment mm. to something for something to happen. Yeah. And actually, for a lot of people, it doesn't happen. No, I just wanted to sleep afterwards. I just, Joel took baby and I just remember being in and out of sleep for a bit. Mm. And it wasn't that kind of euphoric moment of, oh, my God, my baby's here. But when he left and it was just me and her, and I remember saying to the midwives, uh, are you going to help or are you going to be here? Or they said, we'll be here if you need us, but, you know, we'll pretty much just leave you to it. And I I was so, like, scared. I was like, oh, my God, I have to look after her I was like, by what myself. What do you do? Because, I know. Like, you know, you, you've, it's like you said, it was an Olympic day. So that was your, you're treating it like it's an Olympic day. You've won your medal. Yeah. But you, so many of us don't think beyond that no. point. No, and there's don't. this baby that is like a you know little alien to you, really. Yeah. And you don't know if like, I can remember feeling like, am I allowed to pick them up? <laughs> yeah. like, is someone going to come in and tell me off if I do that? Like yeah. you don't know. Yeah, it was really scary. But do you know what? I think I really needed that night. Yeah. Um, just me and her, and by the morning, like obsessed. Did you actually manage to get some sleep? Yeah I, yeah, I think I did. So I tried breastfeeding. We had loads of breastfeeding problems. And it was, got to about 11 p.m. And she'd been screaming on and off since she was born. She was just hungry. Yeah. Um, she was a very greedy baby. So I was just kind of like, can I have some formula? At first they were like, well, why don't you keep trying on the breast and stuff? Can I have some formula? She's really hungry and she won't stop crying. <laughs> I'm really <laughs> tired. Did you feel like you really had to push for that? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And... um she had it and she had half the bottle and she went to sleep and we both got some sleep that night and yeah I was just completely obsessed with her by the morning and I just couldn't wait to take her home so my mum couldn't come because it was I was only allowed one birthing ah. partner but my mum had been with us for the past probably a week and a half just waiting for her to come right so I couldn't wait to go home and like show her to my mum and just yeah start that recovery journey and start our lives together can you remember leaving the hospital yes I remember going for a shower and that being like oh my gosh am I washing is this my body like what am I even touching right now I just felt so weird yeah and a bit in pain and gross um a little bit yeah it was just a bit like you don't really know what's going on down there so you just sort of like oh you just bit you know careful with yourself so that was a little bit weird and then yeah we just packed up and left and we did the whole dad holding the pram pictures and stuff and it was really cute and 
Was your mum literally waiting at home for you? Yeah, yeah, she was at home. So as soon as we came through, she was just like, took her and she is actually the double of my mum. So my mum's really, really fair skinned. And yeah, we was just looking at her, looking at my mum and just going, <laughs> how does she look more like you than she does me? <laughs> and they just had an instant bond as well. Really? It was beautiful, beautiful. Um, because you'd, um, you know, you're, you'd had a... Um, had some issues with your mental health before getting pregnant. Yeah. Was that something that was looked after or that you'd had any focus on for what well, also perinatally and postnatally? Was yeah. it something you were like looking for signs of? Um I'd read a little bit about postnatal depression and also I had a friend who'd had a baby similar time as me who did have postnatal depression. And I'm very self aware, so I was very much like, obviously if I'm struggling I'll talk. Yeah. And if I'm struggling I'll seek help. Um, and I was aware of it, but thankfully I didn't go through, mm -hmm. didn't go through postnatal depression. Um, yeah, I think, but I think being aware of it was very important because I think my friend who went through it wasn't aware and actually never had mental health issues before that. Yeah. That was her first experience. Do so, you think that you, because you've been through it and you have asked for help before, yeah. that it almost took that stigma away from it as oh, well? A hundred percent. Because that's a massive part of it, isn't it? I think when you're in it, those, the conversations in your head, not those voices in your head, but the conversations that you mm. have with yourself are that no one else would understand. Like, mm. it's so, like it tells you lies mm. to feed itself, essentially. Yeah, 100%. But once you've done it once, where you've kind of gone to someone and gone, the, I'm struggling, that mm. stuff's going on. I wonder if that kind of take alleviates the pressure of that as well. Mm. Yeah, I think 100%. Mm. I, 100%. And I'm just, I'm good at talking now. And I just talk things through. And I have such amazing women around me, like, probably two most special women in my life, my mum, and then also my judo coach, who I've been with since I was 11. Oh. And she's got four kids. Right. And I mean, she literally had them like, she was pregnant for like five years. <laughs> <laughs> and had four kids. <laughs> and her kids are amazing. And I look up to her a lot because she has always been a judo coach. So she's always traveled, even from when the kids were really young. Yeah. Um, and spent time away from them and stuff. So... If ever I had any questions or any thoughts, I'd just ask. Yeah. I'd just ask those people and they'd reassure me um, that it's normal. Yeah. It's normal to feel the way you feel. Yeah. Um, and I think with a newborn, every day is just different, isn't it? And you don't know what to expect. And I think in some ways they keep you going mm. as well. Um, even if you are down, you are struggling with postnatal depression. I know one of the things my friend just kept saying is she keeps me going. Yeah. I know I have to show up for her. I know I've got to be good for her. And she gives me strength. So, yeah, I definitely would say that Rai also gave me strength as well just to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a massive life change mm. when you've got that responsibility suddenly. Mm. So it can feel overwhelming, mm. you know, even if it's it, like, because there's so many different things that you can be feeling mentally mm. that isn't post, like, post yeah. like postnatal depression. And it can be a really scary time because of that. Mm. For sure. Physically... How did you feel after birth? I had this image that I was just going to bounce back because I was an athlete. And I'd had, I've always been very toned. And it was not like that at all. Um, I would say the first six weeks, um, I expressed because I couldn't, she couldn't latch straight away. So I just would pump and express for her and feed her through the bottle and she'd latch when she'd want to latch until we got that sorted. And I, I did lose weight quite quickly afterwards. Um, and I remember jumping on the scales and weighing myself and kind of being back within the 60s again, which is, I fight at 57 kilograms, but I would normally walk around at about 62, 63 kilograms at right. that point. So I think I was back to 67 kilos and every you compare everything to judo weight. So I was kind of like, oh, not too far out from, <laughs> you know, this competition weight or whatever. And... But then I just left it there and I thought I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be obsessed about weighing myself because I'm breastfeeding mm -hmm. and I need to eat and I need to feel me and I need to feel her. And I that time was amazing for me because I just learned how to eat like a normal, healthy human. I'd been eating like an athlete and an athlete that was making weight for so long that I was always underfueling. Right. So I actually just made a real conscious thing of making sure I was eating enough each day and eating the right things for her as well. Um, through through you know for the breast milk and stuff 
So um, it was good for me to focus on that. But I think looking at my body in the mirror, it was like, oh my gosh, I had loose skin, stretch marks. And I was like, I didn't expect that. Right. I just thought I'd bounce back because I was like, I've looked after my body my whole life. Like, why did I not just bounce back? But mm -hmm. I just kept saying to myself, it's the price I've paid for a really beautiful baby. So, <laughs> <laughs> But it must also be take. hard, though, if within your sport, no one has gone from mm. that like, postpartum body back to sport. Mm. You know, like you've seen it in other, other you know, like with Jessica Ennis Hill yeah. and people like that. But within your sport, if you've not seen that mm. and it's not been done close to you, mm. you know, is it, does it, did it feel overwhelming? I think I was just more like when it sunk in that, like, I wouldn't feel the same anymore wearing a bikini or I wouldn't be as body confident as I was before. I was kind of like, oh, I am a different me. Yeah. And I think it did probably take me about a year to really feel okay in my own skin again. Um, but I think, again, with what I do, I just switched my focus. I switched my focus to focusing more on what my body could do yeah. than what it looked like. Yeah. Um, and to go from not being able to sit up after birth to doing like weighted pull-ups <laughs> six months in, yeah, I was just like, my body is insane. My body's amazing. And how did you like dip your toe back into training? Just step by step. Really? Just slow. Just, you know, you start off with just trying to engage the, the, the pelvic floor and get the stomach muscles back. I had um, abba separation as well, quite quite a big one. So it was just about getting all that strength back again to yeah. be able to train. I knew I couldn't just jump back into training. I had to build. And I think one of the, the things that I've always done is just taking the steps, being consistent, mm -hmm. turned up every day, done the little bits of work that, you know, get you to reach that big destination. And that's all I did. I didn't see it as this is where I want to be. It yeah. was just this is where I'm now. And these are the steps I'm going to take to get to somewhere. I'm not sure where that is yet. I hadn't set myself a goal. But um, my goal was to just try to get back to judo. Yeah. Even recreationally, not even for competition. And I just built. And by six months, I was back lifting heavy in the gym again, back on the mat. And, yeah, start inspiring again. So it was, like, well, how amazing. How did that feel? Because not only have you just become a mum, but you, you'd had your injury. Yeah. So how did it feel being back sparring and stuff? amazing like I, it just felt so long and it just felt like an impossible task I just thought it was never going to happen again yeah. and it wasn't easy because I still had residual symptoms that I would struggle with but it was learning how to manage them mm. um whilst also having a six month old that you're sleep deprived <laughs> and that also has an effect as well yeah so I mean because before you would have been able to go right I'm going to sleep at nine and I'm up at six mm. or whatever but like at that point, who knows? You go to bed and go, good luck. Like, yeah. Who knows? Literally. So it was respecting both. It yeah. was respecting the concussion and how that's completely changed my life and I will never be the same again. And then respecting being a mother and knowing that, look, first and foremost, I need to be what I need to be for my child first. Mm. So it was respecting both. And there'd be some days where I could only train three days a week or four days a week. And there'd be sessions planned in, but if I would wake up and I'd only slept two hours, I wouldn't go into training. Really? Or I would say, I can come in a bit later yeah. when I've rested a bit. Or And they were so good at being flexible with me as well. And for those first six months, I they like they let me treat it like maternity. So I didn't have to step a foot in the building if I didn't want to. Right. But I wanted to. Yeah. So from eight weeks, I was back in, just routine for me. Um, and it gave me a few hours break every day. Um, so I was going three, four, three days a week at first and then I built it up to four and then to five. Yeah. But even if I was only away for two hours, it was a nice little break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and also I imagine to feel like you again. Yeah. Like this is what I do. Yeah. And I needed that. Yeah. I really needed that. And, you know, you get the difference of opinions with different mums, stay at home mums and mums that work and, you know, and it's like, oh, I don't know how you do that. And. I was just honest with myself. I was like, I can't be a good mom if I don't have this. Yeah. If I don't have these couple hours, I need them. I need them to be able to go back and be the best mom that I can be. Yeah. So I just accepted that quite early on that I'm going to be one of them mums. And that's okay because she's going to be a great kid regardless. Yeah. Yeah. And at what point was the the goal set you are now back Mm. with team, team DB properly. Judo is back on the cards. Mm. Absolutely, this is your future. Yeah. Probably say we got to about eight or nine months. So I've been back doing sparring for a little while now. 
and the Commonwealth Games was in Birmingham and I got a job offer to work there, which was amazing. Um, so I'd won the Commonwealth eight years before that. Right. So it was weird going back and being in a different role, yeah. even though I was still actively training. So I remember I even did a training session with the team <laughs> and then went back to work. Yeah. Um, so that was amazing. So we, I was ready at that point, but we set our sights just a little bit further and we booked in an easier competition for the September of that year. So I was more than ready for it. I was, yeah. I was literally chomping at the bit at that, at that point. And then Riad had just had a first birthday. So I'd been with her pretty much for that whole year. And then I was going away for my first competition away in Austria. And I didn't fight my normal weight category. I fought the, the weight ab above. Right. Um, I didn't want the pressure of making weight for the first one back. Yeah. And so I just went and enjoyed it. And it was amazing. Um, I think I just lost out for bronze, but it was a fun day. Yeah. But weirdly, I, cry I cried after I lost. I was really upset. Why? I think the competitive side of me. And if I'd gone and lost first fight, I don't think I would have been bothered. Yeah. But because I'd won some fights and I'd gotten to the final block and then lost for a medal, it hurt. I was yeah. like, okay, the competitive edge is still there. And then the following week, so literally a week after, I fought at my regular weight category back at 57s, which was huge, making it after three years. Mm. And I won gold. <laughs> and that was insane. And it was so, it was like a I'm back moment. Yeah. Well, and thing. how does it feel now knowing that when, you know, when you were thinking about becoming a mum, there was no one in the sport to to show you how it could be done. Whereas now for other people, you are that person. Yeah, I think... There's literally, you just have to roll with it a little bit. And we find that we just stumble across problems and then we have to problem solve. Yeah. So after those competitions, I, w I then did my first Olympic qualifier and I got to the competition. I've got a new coach, by the way, as well. So that, you know, so many changes yeah. there. And I won the first fight. And when I came off, he was like, oh, I just don't think you fought very well in that one. And I was kind of like, oh, okay, you know, it's fine. A bit of criticism, it's fine. Yeah. Second fight, I won that one. It was a bit of a slog. And he said, oh, you just made that girl look really good. And I thought, it's okay, it's criticism, I can take it. And then I got back to the warm area and I was like, I can't take criticism. I, I, re I re it really, really got to me. And I just felt like I just wanted to retreat and I didn't want to be there. Really? Yeah. And that was like a big thing for me because I'd been, I'd always been so mentally strong before in the sport, very confident in what my, like my ability and everything. And suddenly I'm back and I'm winning fights, but then there's that criticism there. And I was just kind of like, I'm not confident. I'm not as confident as I used to be. And then that's been, that's been our biggest challenge. Really? My, my confidence. Yeah. In the last year, I would probably say that my confidence has been the thing that's held me back the most. Um, not necessarily the ability to do it anymore. So like I said, there's no, there's no manual. No one's telling me how to do it. We just have to problem solve along yeah. the way. So how do we build confidence? That's where we're at now. Yeah. You know, how can I really go out and showcase everything I can physically do and not be held back by that fear of being judged or not being good enough or, yeah. So it's, uh, it's amazing. I probably should write about it at some point. <laughs> Absolutely it's gonna be, should. Yeah. And it's that, like, like we were saying, story. like if no one else is done it in the sport, then you, everyone's looking to you and, and you're trying to find your way, Yeah, you know, into this because motherhood does change you. Yeah. Coming back from an injury does change you. Mm. So it's understandable that, mm. you know, you're, you're building up this inner side as well as the physical side. Mm. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, there's, there's so much to it. It's literally got layers on layers and on, on yeah, layers. Yeah, yeah. But I just keep coming back to my why. Why am I back? Why am I here? Who am I doing it for? Yeah. And that helps me simplify it and just make it very, very specific. I, I read somewhere that you wrote um, something like, I think about how proud Rye will be when I'm on the podium at Paris 2024. Mm. I'm like, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 Incredible. She'll be three then and, you know, she'll kind of just be talking and understanding what's yeah. going on. And I just, yeah, she'd be so proud. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. <laughs> if you could write a letter on motherhood, mm. who would it be to and what would you say? I would probably write it to my younger self, the, the, my younger self who was really eager to have a child. Uh, 
because you just feel like it's not going to happen. Yeah. But I would just say to myself to be patient, wait, because you wait until the right time for you. Yeah. And it was perfect. So, you know, it was okay to wait. It was okay to, to, to take your time a little bit and to live your life and enjoy um, and to not be so eager to get to that stage in life. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that to myself, I think, yeah. looking back. And um, just to go into it with no expectation, I think, because I went in like, I'm going to be this type of mum, I'm going to do this. <laughs> and, and you know what? You just got to roll with it. Well, and also like the juggle, because, you know, I've read stuff that you've said before where you were like, motherhood was going to be something that that that, that happened after retirement when mm. you were in retirement that is when yeah. you know that's when that would and that would be something that you could really focus on then away mm. from the sport whereas now mm. you are juggling the two yeah you know you're going on training camps mm. and you're like investing in that but you've still got the weight of what's going on at home and yeah. you know so you it, it is the in the thick of the the juggle the mm. guilt that comes with that that's so unnecessary but it's a thing that mums go through mm. Um, you know, so I think it's all, it's all learning and it's not, it's understandable that it looks different to what you yeah. thought it would. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And would I have waited longer? I don't think. No, really? no. I think that it was always part of my plan and I think my plan was the right plan. What wasn't part of my plan was coming back. <laughs> Um, and how does that feel yeah. now? Because I, I, I imagine as well, it must have felt like such unfinished business. Yeah, 100%. A hundred percent. And, but it's a weird one because it's like, are you back to prove something to other people or yourself? Or are you back because you just love what you do? And I think I'm back because I just love what I do. That's what I'm getting from talking to you. Yeah. I don't feel like I have anything to prove. If I finished today, I'd be happy with my career. Yeah. I just love what I do and the opportunities that could come from an Olympic medal next year is just insane. And I have to give that a shot. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Well, I can't wait to watch <laughs> you progress over the next year. Yeah. It's amazing. Thank you. We finished the podcast with you completing three sentences. Yeah. The first one is being a mum means. So being a mum to me means quite a few things. I think it's being a protector, being a provider, being a role model, um, and just being that person that is any and any any and everything to my my daughter. Mm. Since having a child, I I have a new since having a child, I have a newfound respect for parents, for mothers <laughs> and what they do and the struggle. Um yeah. And I'm happy when. I'm happy when I'm at home chilling on the sofa with Raya, eating snacks. We <laughs> love snacks. <laughs> That's just like our favourite thing to do. <laughs> you know, that's not going anywhere. Like the amount of times I, during the day that I hear, can I have a snack? Can yeah. I have a snack? Yeah. Can I have a snack? And I don't say no, because I'm just as bad. Yeah. I'm like, I can't be a hypocrite and say no. What are you snacking on? Nice things. Good. <laughs> Chocolate. Nice. Biscuits. I want a snack with you. <laughs> Definitely. I like those things. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure oh. to, to hear all about your experience and your journey to get to this point. And I, like I said, I can't wait to see what happens next year. Thank you. Thank you for having me so much. It's literally an honour to be here. Thank you.